Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, a weekly webinar from Code Pink's Latin America team. Today, my guest is journalist Ben Norton from The Gray Zone. Thanks for having me, Leonardo. So I kind of want the bulk of the interview to focus on RAIN, the Responsive Assistance in Nicaragua plan. But for our audience who hasn't been following the country, can you talk a bit about the attempted coup in the NICA Act of 2018? Absolutely. So the important thing to, go, to keep in mind with Nicaragua is that this is one of the only countries, and I say this, I, I've been living actually here in Nicaragua for th this year, and, and I was here last year as well on the anniversary of the revolution. Nicaragua is, is one of the few countries left in Latin America that has a socialist government. It has a, and it's a democratically elected socialist government like in Venezuela. And in the, in the discourse of the U.S. government, Nicaragua is part of the so-called Troika of Tyranny. John Bolton, the former National Security Advisor, used that language. It has since been echoed by other members of the Trump administration. Now, why? Who, who are the three members of the Troika of Tyranny? It's Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, the three remaining leftist governments in the region. And in the case of Nicaragua, this, the, the government is the Sandinista government. People might have heard that in 1979, there was a revolution against a U.S.-backed dictatorship of Samosa and the revolutionaries who overthrew the right-wing dictatorship 20 years after a very similar revolution in Cuba. Here in Nicaragua, they, they call themselves the Sandinistas. And the Sandinista Front of National Liberation, which is the, their, their political party, is the democratically elected governing party in Nicaragua. And there's a long history I don't have time to get into, but they had the revolution in 1979, and then there was a U.S. terror war through the Contra death squads against the government in the 80s. There was a blockade similar to Venezuela, and they, they lost power through democratic elections in the 90s. There was a neoliberal era. But then in 2006, the Sandinistas came back into power through elections. And since then, since 2006, the Sandinistas have continued to win all of the elections and govern the country under President Daniel Ortega. And they have a, you know, a leftist political and economic model. They have free, uh, they free education. They have free health care. And the health system here is absolutely incredible. We need to keep in mind that Nicaragua is the second poorest country in, Latin, in the entire Western Hemisphere. It's right after Haiti. So Nicaragua is very poor in terms of numbers, but it's very rich in terms of social services. It's very rich in terms of government services that, that provide, again, um, basically free education and free healthcare. And the healthcare is incredible because if you look at other countries in Central America, which are more similar to Nicaragua, which are quite poor countries, there's nothing even remotely similar to the model of free healthcare here in Nicaragua. The government has, has invested a, a huge proportion of its, of its budget in, in healthcare. So, you know, they've made a lot of strides in fighting illiteracy in vaccination programs and public health. And of course, the U.S. government has seen Nicaragua as this, this, this bastion that has an anti-imperialist foreign policy. Nicaragua strongly supports Venezuela and Cuba. Nicaragua is part of the ALBA alliance. Nicaragua has a very activist foreign policy in supporting national liberation movements and anti-colonial movements. It's very close to Russia. So the U.S. has targeted Nicaragua for, many, for decades to overthrow the government and install a more compliant puppet regime that will privatize the economy, impose neoliberal policies, and will vote in support of Israel, will, will vote in, in against Venezuela at the United Nations, et cetera. And two years ago in 2018, there was a coup attempt. And unfortunately, a lot of people outside of Nicaragua, especially in the US, including people on the left, Many portrayed it as, a, as an attempted uprising, as a revolution, which is insane because th these were, I mean, the protests are always mixed. They have a variety of different groups, but the main groups leading it were right-wing neoliberal groups that were backed by the U.S. government, by the National Endowment for Democracy, which is an arm of the CIA created by the Ronald Reagan administration in the 1980s. And one of the co-founders said explicitly that the, the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, did in the 1980s what the CIA had done covertly 25 years before, 
So, and the NED still does that work today out in the open. The NED funds opposition groups in Venezuela and Cuba and other countries. So in Nicaragua, there was a very violent coup attempt. And of course, the police did kill some people. I mean, with any of these, with, as with Venezuela, with the Guarimas, the violent coup attempts there, you know, there is technically violence on both sides. So then people will try to both sides the issue and say, it's brutal repression by police. What they ignore, what they totally obfuscate on purpose is that that, that violence returned by the security forces is, is, it is either proportional or actually not, not only proportional, the, the opposition violence is much worse. So we see terror attacks. We saw, um, of course, in Venezuela, we saw them use bombings and, and such. In, in, in Nicaragua, basically what they did is the same kind of model. The, the Guarimba model in Venezuela was borrowed here and they built things called tranques. Tranques were massive barricades to, to block off traffic and to prevent people from being able to, to operate normally and have a normal life in the country. It really devastated the economy and it blocked the, the transit of goods throughout Central America for months. This began in the spring, in, in, in April of 2018. It went on for several months until July, the anniversary of the revolution. So in this time period, the opposition, they targeted Sandinistas, they burnt down Sandinista houses and radio stations. They would actually mark the houses of Sandinistas, which is terrifying. I, I know friends who were attacked they tortured Sandinistas. I interviewed a Sandinista activist. His father and his brother were murdered. And not only were they murdered by the, the, the golpistas, the coup mongers, not only were they murdered, their bodies were set on fire after, and then the golpistas threw their bodies, the Sandinista activists' bodies in the garbage. So, I mean, it just absolutely hor horrifying. I mean, a, a kind of civil war scenario where the right-wing opposition is trying to overthrow the government. They were unsuccessful because ultimately the opposition is very small in Nicaragua. And there is a very hardcore base of around two thirds of the country, 50, 50 to 60 percent of the country that support the Sandinistas. And the opposition only has a support around 10, maybe 15 percent that's being generous. Polls con consistently show that the Sandinistas have around 60 percent support and the opposition has between 10, 15 percent. So the opposition couldn't, they couldn't succeed in overthrowing the government. And by July 19th, which is the anniversary of the revolution, the coup attempt had totally died out. So of course, as with Venezuela, after the 2014 and 2017 coup attempts, the Guarimbas, the US government turns toward its other form of warfare, economic warfare, sanctions. So after the failed coup attempt here in Nicaragua, the US Congress passed the NICA Act. And we should keep in mind that the NICA Act, which by the way is, is a hilariously redundantly named act because the A in NICA Act already stands for act. So it's like the, the NIC Act Act. But anyway, the, the NICA Act was already written by members of the right wing Florida neoconservatives. You know, these are the, the right wing exiles from Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, other countries who, who went to Miami. And they were already lobbying there even before the, the coup attempt. And they had this legislation that was prepared, but the coup attempt and the media propaganda allowed them to push through this legislation, which put very brutal sanctions on Nicaragua. And of course, the US government frequently says, oh, well, they're targeted sanctions. I always say targeted sanctions on particular government officials. But of course, what they don't mention is that these sanctions prevent the Nicaraguan government from having access to international finance. So it's a kind of, it's a de facto blockade that prevents Nicaragua from accessing international financial institutions. And then since the NICA Act was passed, and I should mention that unfortunately, it was passed in the Congress without any opposition. And it was passed on a voice vote, like some of these, you know, it wasn't an actual a vote on paper, so that, that helped, helped them push it through, but there was no opposition to it which is very tragic considering that, you know, there are some more left-wing members who speak up on issues like Yemen, but unfortunately when it comes to Nicaragua and Venezuela, there's no opposition. And, but anyway, the point is that after the NICA Act was passed, the Trump administration has continued to impose more and more sanctions. And this, this brings us to the lead up 
to the election in 2021 next year, about a year from now. And the Trump administration, it's very clear. And even if Biden somehow manages to win, it's, it's clear that either administration, they're already planning on uh, another coup attempt in the upcoming year of, of 2021. And I'm sure we'll talk about that today. Absolutely. So the latest news in this uh, attempted regime change by the Trump administration in Nicaragua has to do with this RAIN plan, responsive assistance in Nicaragua. Uh, you recently wrote an article about it. Can you explain to us what this plan is and what it entails? Absolutely. So RAIN, this is just the latest regime change scheme. And I should mention that this is really under the aegis of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. Like I mentioned the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED. These groups are very similar. They have origins at the end of the Cold War. And the U.S. government realized that they could basically kind of outsource the CIA color revolution apparatus that it developed during the, the Cold War. And a lot of the work that the CIA did then, they could just do it openly in the name of democracy promotion because it's basically serving the same role. So, so USAID is similar. This is a group that claims to be humanitarian. It claims to be the humanitarian arm of the U.S. government, but it's another CIA cutout. It works closely with the State Department. It works closely with intelligence agencies. And even more recently, I reported at the Gray Zone on a, a new USAID strategy document that talks about how they're talking about working, embedding with the military and embedding with special operations forces and helping with drone assassinations. So this is the so-called humanitarian wing working with the military. Uh, in Venezuela last year, in February, during the coup attempt on the Colombia border with Venezuela, USAID played a crucial role working hand in glove with the Pentagon and the Mike Pompeo State Department to try to overthrow the, the government using aid, so-called aid as a weapon, a regime change weapon. So it's more of the same. And we should also keep in mind that the USAID strategy targeting Nicaragua, the USAID under Trump, it's become even more explicitly this right-wing institution. The current coordinator, the de facto director of USAID is named John Barça. He is the son of Cuban-American exiles who voluntarily left because of the revolution. And they were, of course, very elite, rich exiles in, in, who resettled in Miami. And John Barça, who was born in the U.S., he has never been to Cuba, but he's he has that background and is a die-hard anti-communist. He hates Cuba. He hates Nicaragua. He hates Venezuela. He's the head of this so-called humanitarian wing of the U.S. government. So it's very clear what the priorities are. But I should also mention that USAID has historically been linked to more democratic forces with, with, a, with a, a capital D, right? They, so it's not necessarily like this is just the Trump administration. If Joe Biden wins and becomes president, these programs are going to continue because they continued under Obama. And with the, in the case of Biden, there will be even more neoconservatives who will be overseeing his, his foreign policy. So this, these are bipartisan policies. But anyway, the, all that said, the, the strategy document was released. I have it here and you can find it at the gray zone. I published a report that there is a 93 page document that, that, it's a strategy document for responsive assistance in Nicaragua, RAIN. And there was a 14 page section of it that was, that was published. And why was it published? Well, I did some investigation and it turns out that on LinkedIn, you know, openly on LinkedIn, Democracy International, which is another, it's an, it's an extension of USAID. It's, an, it's a regime change organ of the US government funded by the US State Department and by the U.S. Congress, ultimately, the, this group, Democracy International, posted a job application on uh, LinkedIn calling for someone who can be a senior level technical expert in democracy, human rights, and governance. So what they're really looking for is they were looking for someone here inside Managua, the capital of Nicaragua, who can be their point person, a liaison, who can help coordinate the coup attempt, the, the regime change attempt here on the ground in Venezuela. And what happened is apparently, I, I, it seems pretty likely that someone in Nicaragua who supports the Sandinistas applied for this job and then was sent this 14 page document outlining the strategy and published it 
So there, in local media outlets, there was a big scandal and people were talking about it. Now, let's talk about what the document actually says. I mean, I'm not going to summarize the whole thing. People who are interested can look it up on the grayzone.com, gray with an A. But so what, are, what are the goals of this regime change scheme? Well, very clearly, they say they want transition. And in 14 pages, they use the word transition 102 times. So transition, we want transition, transition. That's, that's a nice word for regime change. And they spell out three different scenarios for regime change, which would be hard regime change, soft regime change, and prolonged regime change. So hard would be a military coup, an overthrow of the government. A soft would be something similar to what happened in Brazil, where there was a parliamentary coup, a, a political coup, or the, the government loses the elections in 2021. And then a prolonged, prolonged regime change scenario is the coup attempt fails, the Sandinistas freely and fairly win the election coming up next year, and then they, they, they continue the regime change attempt over the long term. Those, those are the scenarios spelled out by the document, and there's more, there's more details. But now what's the goal ultimately of the U.S. government? Because this isn't even just my opinion. They state very explicitly why the U.S. government wants to overthrow the Sandinista government here in Nicaragua. They say that one of the top, quote, mission goals is, and I'm quoting exactly from the document, quote, transition to a rules-based market economy, and that's based on, quote, protection of private property rights. Okay, so they want a neoliberal government that will overthrow the socialist economic policies, that will privatize the economy, that will privatize education and healthcare. And then they also say, what, what, what is their other goal? Their, one of their other top so-called mission goals is, quote, rebuild institutions and, quote, reestablish and, and dismantle parallel institutions. And they, they specifically target the military and the police. So what they mean by that is they want to, quote, reestablish the military and the police, they want to create new military and new police forces that purge all of the nationalists and the Sandinista loyalists who support the Sandinista revolution. Basically, this is a, a model, this is modeled after the debathification program in Iraq. After the US government invaded Iraq and overthrew the government, they understood that there would be elements of the government that would be sympathetic and, and supportive of the old government who want to restore the Ba'athist government. So they had a policy of de-Ba'athification, removing anyone who had been involved in the previous government, anyone who had nationalist sensibilities, and then create a new technocratic regime of puppets who will be subservient to the US. That's exactly what they want to repeat in Nicaragua, removing all the Sandinistas. And not only that, they say in the document they want, quote, transitional justice measures. That, that's code word for lawfare. This is a term that's become more prominent we saw in Bolivia where the US government and right-wing oligarchs here in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Brazil, they, they use the language of justice and legal mechanisms to wage political warfare or lawfare, right? We saw this with Sergio, Sergio Moro, who is the right-wing justice minister, very closely linked to the CIA and FBI, who worked hand in glove with the US government and the Lava Jato operation in Brazil to overthrow the Workers' Party government. So we're seeing a hybrid war. There's the lawfare element, the economic warfare element with sanctions, and the, the political warfare through an, an attempted coup. And they spell it out very clearly in this document. Yeah, I mean, it's such, to me, it's really kind of stunning how brazen they are about their attempts at regime change, even going so far as to basically advertise on LinkedIn for someone to draw up these plans. And, and I think a couple of days ago, we had uh, Joe Biden called Daniel Ortega, President Ortega, a dictator. So this is, as you said, a total a bipartisan consensus. There's basically no opposition to attempted regime change in, in Nicaragua or Venezuela or Cuba uh, in the U.S. political establishment. And for Nicaragua, I mean, we have to like mention that under President Ortega, you talked about it a bit, but Nicaragua has cut poverty in half. They've nearly eliminated illiteracy. They've seen a huge increase in uh, women holding public offices. They've addressed the gender pay gap. Uh, and the country has become much more economically equal now than it was prior to uh, the, the Sandinistas coming back into power. 
you know, and you also mentioned why the U.S. wants regime change, because basically because Nicaragua is one of three socialist governments. Can you talk a little bit more? I mean, this has been throughout what you've been saying, you've been drawing some of these parallels between uh, what the U.S. is doing in Nicaragua, Venezuela and, and, and Bolivia as well. Absolutely. So what's interesting is that you mentioned a really important point, the role of women. In Nicaragua, the Sandinistas have very highly emphasized the role of women in society, and that also models what the Chavistas have done in, in Venezuela. The vice president, uh, Delcio Rodriguez, in, in, in Venezuela is a woman, and the vice president here in, in Nicaragua, um, Rosario Murillo, is also a, a feminist and strongly supportive of women's rights. And she has really prioritized, and the Sandinista Front has prioritized, women's representation. In fact, Nicaragua is in the top five countries in the entire world for representation of women in government. It's, it's, there, there's a law saying that half of government positions have to be filled by women, and they take it very seriously. The, the lifeblood of the Sandinista Front is what's called Juventud Sandinista, the, the, the Sandinista youth. And the, the Juventud Sandinista is largely women. If you go to a lot of their events, they really emphasize the role of women in society. They're very empowered. And it's, it's very interesting because in the right-wing governments in Latin America, they, you don't in, in any way see that kind of representation, but you will see the, that some of these forces will try to demonize Nicaragua and Venezuela also because, uh, you know, unfortunately, they, they have very restrictive abortion laws and they'll use that just that one particular aspect of society to try to portray Nicaragua and Venezuela as anti-woman because for a variety of complex historical and cultural reasons, these are pretty religious Catholic and Christian societies and abortion is not a popular policy. The vast majority of people don't support abortion, including the working class base of the Sandinistas and the Chavistas. So yes, it's true that Nicaragua has very strict anti-abortion laws, but that's only one small part of laws concerning women. But you'll hear a lot of feminists in the US, you'll hear even right-wing forces in other parts of Latin America will criticize Nicaragua for that. So we need to keep in mind the larger picture of women's representation in Nicaragua, which is absolutely impressive. You also mentioned poverty. They've, the government has made poverty um, reduction a major priority. And Nicaragua is the fourth most equal country in Latin America which people might say, well, you know, fourth is not that high, but consider again, Nicaragua is the second poorest country in the Western hemisphere. The only country poorer than it is Haiti. And we've seen the horrific, you know, neo-colonial oppression of Haiti. So the fact that Nicaragua has been able to accomplish that with very few resources is incredible. And, and part and parcel of the poverty reduction, which is extremely important, is the Nicaraguan government's emphasis on the camp campesino movement, working with the peasants, working with the farmers. The government has really heavily prioritized that. In the neoliberal era, there was more privatization of land. There, there were, you know, and, and especially before the revolution in 79, in the Somoza dictatorship era, there were many elite, not many, there was a small handful of elite families who controlled the vast majority of the land in the country, especially up in, in, the, in the coffee areas, in the, in the mountainous areas like Hinotega and Matagalpa. And the, you also had elites who, who were from European descent, who were dom dominating the land there. And the government has really prioritized giving land back to peasants. And in fact, Nicaragua is, has the second highest rate of state ownership of, of capital and land in Latin America after Cuba. It's slightly over 50% of the capital and land in Nicaragua is publicly owned. So they've really prior to prioritize that. It's very impressive what they've been able to accomplish. And, I, and I'll have to say that, you know, I've been to Honduras last year with my, with the, my colleagues in the Gray Zone, we went to Honduras, which is neighboring in, in Central America. It's neighboring Nicaragua. And the, the, the comparison is night and day. Honduras is absolutely, it's plagued by violence. It, had the, it actually had the highest murder rate in the world after a U.S.-backed coup in 2009. For several years, it had the highest murder rate, a great victory of the U.S. coup regime. And the poverty is just so, it's so striking. So the fact that you have a government that cares for, for poor people is incredible. And then I mentioned earlier, we, can't, we can't, can't underestimate the importance of Nicaragua's foreign policy. 
I will say that Nicaragua's relations with China for a variety of historical reasons are very complex, but excluding that, that contradiction, that historical complexity there, Nicaragua is a strong voice on the international stage for anti-imperialist movements and national liberation movements, supporting the sovereignty of foreign countries that are under siege. Nicaragua has joined with Venezuela and Cuba and Russia and China and other countries in opposing sanctions and economic warfare and calling for new forms of multilateral institutions and new economic relations. So, and I mentioned that the ALBA Alliance, Nicaragua is still part of the ALBA Alliance created by Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And we can't underestimate how much the US government, even above other priorities, one of its top priorities is destroying these other economic alliances that were developed. And the ALBA alliance is, unfortunately, it's much weaker now than it was 10 years ago, but Nicaragua still r remains a member and is still committed to, to inter-South integration, South-South integration, trying to work with other countries in Latin America to integrate their economies instead of just subordinating their economy to the superpower in the United States. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to bring up uh, in terms of why the U.S. wants regime change against Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. And one of the reasons is, of course, as you mentioned, that these three countries are leading the hemisphere in, in countering U.S. hegemony, countering U.S. imperialism, and denouncing it at every turn. I'm also really gl glad you brought up the issue of feminism and how it's being used to kind of uh, undermine the Ortega administration, the Ortega government. Because we saw something similar with environmentalism uh, happen with uh, the Morales government in Bolivia. So there's kind of this uh, attempt by the State Department and by all these uh, U.S. imperial forces to, to present a sort of woke imperialism and to, and to present regime change as something progressive when it's obviously everything but. Uh, and switching tacks a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the pandemic. A few months ago, Nicaragua was in the corporate media spotlight over its coronavirus response, despite the fact that it was doing and continues to do significantly better than its neighbors. Can you tell us a bit about how Nicaragua has responded to the pandemic? Absolutely. Nicaragua took a response that is the specific response needed for its material conditions, the, the political conditions, the historical conditions, the cultural context and the economics specifically, because we need to keep in mind, again, you know, I keep stressing this point, not, not as something against Nicaragua, but as a fact, it's that Nicaragua is a very poor country. And it's really interesting to me that there's so much criticism of Nicaragua by the US left, by the Canadian European left. And there's never, a, there's never understanding of the fact that this is a very poor country that has been colonized for most of its history until the Sandinista revolution. It was essentially colonized by the US government. It was controlled by the, occupied by the US military for decades. So we need to keep in mind that history because there's so many people on the left in the US who, who look toward Nicaragua and also to Venezuela, which is a richer country, but still much poorer compared to the US. They, they look to these, these relatively poor countries in the global south and blame them for all their perfection and their, all their imperfections and not, don't understand that the, the real conditions that they're dealing with. And the fact of the matter is that when it came to the pandemic, even though I don't want to downplay the economic harm that it did to the US and the real economic issues that working class Americans are going through, what the US did cannot be repeated in a country like Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, around 60%, the estimates vary, but more than half of the country works in the informal sector. I've seen estimates as high as in the 70 percentile range. That means, what does that mean? That means that the majority of the population doesn't get a paycheck. The majority of the population doesn't have a bank account. So yes, it's absolutely true that the, the US policy has been horrific and not nearly enough. A mere $1,200 check, cannot, most people cannot get by on one $1,200 check considering they've been in, in quarantine for months. But the, the fact of the matter is that even though that's not enough, that's possible in the US. That's not possible in Nicaragua. And also Mexico took a similar model. It's not possible in Mexico. These are countries where people, the majority of people, they live day by day with what they make. So they, and also I mentioned the economic model of Nicaragua. Over half of the economy of the, of the GDP is in state control, public, publicly owned. But also one of the things that the Nicaraguan government has really emphasized is kind of small business 
ownership, right? But, but not in the way that people in the US think about it. Rather, because in, the, in Nicaragua, a lot of people, they, they're their own employers, right? They don't have bosses. They, they cook food. They provide services. They make, they make, you know, textiles. They make, you know, artisanal goods, things like that. They're taxi drivers. The economy is, is based on, you know, peop, mom and pop stores, right? It really is the majority of the economy. So if you have that kind of an, an economy, how are you supposed to survive a quarantine? And how are you supposed to give people money? How are you supposed to give people food? When I mean, I guess you could physically deliver them food, but you can't give them money if they don't have bank accounts. So Nicaragua realized that it had to take a, a particular approach that sure, it wasn't just free for all. The idea that everything was a free for all is ridiculous. Most of, of the non-necessary parts of the economy shut down, but they didn't have a total quarantine. And the government provided, you know, masks and alcohol and things like that. And everywhere you go, you can find masks and alcohol. And you see people everywhere you go wearing masks and things like that. The government, on, if you watch any TV channel, the public TV channels, constantly during the commercial breaks, they're there's the actually gets kind of annoying. There's the same like three ads about coronavirus and they have like this song, coronavirus, I mean, so like they, 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 they took it very seriously. The idea that the government didn't have any measures is ridiculous propaganda, but because the government didn't totally shut down the economy, there was all this propaganda demonizing Nicaragua saying that they're killing their own people, etc. But what's incredible is as you mentioned, Leo, is that even if, okay, the opposition is claiming that the government has been downplaying the number of deaths. We don't have any evidence of that, but let's say we accept that claim. All right, even if you accept the own claims of the opposition for the actual supposed number of deaths, it's still significantly lower per capita than the number of deaths in the US and the number of deaths in Brazil. And of course, they, they all look to, to Bolsonaro and Trump as their heroes. So, it's also lower than in other parts of Latin America, like Ecuador. You know, it's easy to look toward the U.S. because the U.S. has the worst case in the world. And Brazil has the second worst case in the world. Ecuador has also been a total disaster. And if you look at toward Ecuador, it's much worse than Nicaragua. The, the answer, the question is, why is that? It's because in Nicaragua, there is a massive public investment in the health sector, period. That is the most important factor. That is also the most important factor in the U.S., why so many people have died. And look, I need to be honest. I, I don't think we should just blame Trump. Even if, even if Hillary Clinton had been president, I think the U.S. would still clearly be the, world, the leader of the world in deaths for coronavirus. And maybe it would be a little better, but it's, it is because the public health, the, there is no public health. The public health sector, is, it's an oxymoron in the U.S. Whereas in Nicaragua, the government spends upward, I think of 15 to 20% of its entire budget just on the health sector. And if you, if you factor in other things like education, the government spends over half of its entire budget on social services for people. That is why the government has been able to deal so well with the crisis. And every country has been affected by it. But, and of course, uh, there have been people who have died, which is tragic. But looking at the situation here, I've been living here, I, I've been living through the coronavirus situation. It hasn't been that bad, honestly. And there was a balance, I think. It was a pretty fair balance between not having a quarantine, but still having a functioning economy so people don't starve, but also shutting down the unnecessary parts of the economy that, that might endanger people's public health. Yeah, and just for some context in terms of figures, Nicaragua has less than 5,000 cases total. 141 deaths as of uh, September 7th, and their deaths per million population are 21 compared to 583 for the United States and over 900 for Peru, uh, which is one of the most poor, uh, worst hit countries in Latin America. Thank you yeah, so and, much. And for, and, and in response talk. to those numbers, people, some people say that the government hasn't because the government doesn't have the ability to do all of the comprehensive testing that it needs, etc. Sure, maybe maybe the figures are higher, but again, even if those government, even if the government figures are not quite accurate, we even if you look at the fi figures of the opposition, 
which has a vested interest in exaggerating the figures, even their numbers are sign significantly lower per capita than other figures in the US, Brazil, and Ecuador. So once again, I mean, we, we have to look at the layers of propaganda. And I'll just say that there's so much fake news, so much propaganda targeting Nicaragua, the, the media will, will for, for weeks, just like with North Korea, for weeks, the media will claim that Daniel Ortega had died. They, they did that a few months ago. They said that he died and that the government was hiding it. And then he came out and gave a speech. So people just really need to, to exercise critical thinking and be skeptical of what they see. Because just as with Venezuela, there's, there's constant lies about Nicaragua. Absolutely. And in that regard, I think the gray zone does a great job in telling people the truth about countries like Nicaragua and Venezuela. Thank you again so much for being with us here with us today, Ben. Thanks for having me, Leo. And thanks to keep up all the great work. You all are doing amazing work at Code Pink and we need more of you. Thank you.